Sweat is extremely important to the normal functioning of the human body. And most of the time when we think about sweat, we think about being hot or sweating during exercise. And we're definitely gonna talk about why this is so important with those specific activities. But did you know that your body produces different types of sweat and will sweat in different ways based upon the stimulus, the activity, or even the emotion? Did you know your sweat glands can even change and adapt? How is this happening? How is it possible? Well, today's video, we're gonna address these changes, the different types of sweat and sweating, and of course, how this all relates to exercise and athletic performance. It's going to be a moist one, I guess. Well, enough of the bad jokes. Let's just jump right into this anatomical awesomeness. Sweat is produced by certain glands that are found in your skin. Now there are other skin glands that produce secretions that are not considered sweat, and so I should probably just briefly mention them because they're kind of cool. For example, the ceruminous glands produce cerumen, and cerumen is just a fancy pants name for the wax that's produced in your ear canal. There's also the sebaceous glands which produce sebum. Sebum is this oily substance that helps to moisturize, soften, make the hair and skin more pliable. And this gland you can thank for making your hair and skin a little bit greasy if it's been a small season since you showered last. That gland also gets involved in acne, but that's for a different video. But the two glands that are involved in producing actual sweat are called the apocrine gland and the eccrine gland. Now these glands are super cool. One, they produce different types of sweat and they actually get activated by different types of stimuli. But before we go into all these amazing details about sweat, allow me to take a second to mention and say thank you to the sponsor of today's video, Yoga Body Teachers College. They specialize in science-based online certification programs for yoga teachers, yoga breathing coaches, yoga trapeze teachers, and stretching coaches. If you're interested in starting a new career or a side job, helping people improve their health, overcome injuries, manage stress, and live their best lives longer, Yoga Body's courses might be right for you. Yoga Body takes a science-based, business-positive approach to yoga. They turn passionate students into successful teaching professionals. Since 2007, Yoga Body has certified over 23,000 teachers in 41 countries. They are backed by Yoga Alliance, American Council on Exercise, and even American Council on Education, making them one of the only schools in the world eligible for college credits. Yoga Body has put together a free report for you called How to Choose a Yoga Teacher Training Program. You can access it immediately at yogabody.com forward slash IHA. So let's start with the apocrine gland. Apocrine glands are mainly found in the skin of the armpits, anus, genital region, as well as the areoli and bearded regions of the face. Now these apocrine glands are associated with hair follicles. And what I mean by that is that they actually first dump their secretions into the hair follicle and that secretion will eventually make it onto the surface of the skin. Now, the secretion of the apocrine glands, this type of sweat is actually a more viscous or thicker type of sweat than what we're used to thinking about with more of that watery sweat, which we'll get to that type of sweat in just a second. But when the apocrine gland secretes this more viscous, thicker secretion, what's really interesting about it is that the secretion is initially odorless, but as that sweat or secretion spreads onto the skin and the bacteria that live on your skin start to break down some of the proteins in that secretion, that's when that magical musty smell arises that we all know and love as BO or body odor. Now these apocrine glands and the secretions or the sweat that they produce actually don't do much for thermoregulation or cooling you down. But something that is interesting about this type of sweat is that it contains pheromones. Pheromones are chemical substances released by animals that can affect the behavior or physiology of another animal within that same species. Now these discussions about pheromones often center around behaviors like reproduction and attraction. And with certain animals and insects, what pheromones actually do and how they're affecting these animals and insects is a little bit more clear. But with humans, our behavior around attraction and reproduction is a little bit more complex. So how, a pherom how pheromones affect humans, how much, if at all, is not totally clear. But there are some curious things we need to consider here. Apocrine glands are stimulated during emotional stress and more interesting to this pheromone discussion during sexual excitement. Also, when a female is close to or about to ovulate, the cells within the apocrine glands enlarge, which means a greater potential for more of these secretions. So maybe that extra potential for that wonderful musty smell is getting people all riled up to reproduce during a time where a female is most fertile. And let's be honest, 
Some of you, whether you care to admit it or not, probably have just felt sometimes that you just really like the natural musty odor or smell of your significant other, and it gets you all riled up in your nether regions. Or this is just a remnant of old anatomy and physiology from a common ancestor. More time and research will tell. So let's move on to the other sweat gland. Now this sweat gland is much more common than the apocrine gland, and as we mentioned earlier, this is called the eccrine gland. The eccrine gland is much more important to thermal regulation and actually cooling you off. Say like when you started exercising during a hot yoga class. These glands are found in the skin throughout most parts of the body. There are some exceptions where you won't find them, things like the lips, the nail beds, the end of the penis and clitoris, as well as the labia minorum. Now these glands produce the sweat that we're all kind of accustomed to thinking about, that watery sweat that emerges, say, when we get hot and or exercise. And these glands are not associated with hair follicles. If we take a look at this model here, this white structure is an example of an eccrine gland. This coiled area is the glandular body where the sweat or secretions are produced. And then you can see the duct would take it directly to the surface of the skin. Now where you find these glands in the highest concentration would be like the forehead and the face, palms of hands, soles of feet. But again, most regions throughout the body will have these, but in their highest concentrations, you'll see as many as 450 of these glands per square centimeter. So how much sweat could these produce actually? And how would this affect athletic performance? Can they adapt? And maybe some of you have heard that sweat kind of provides a secondary function of ridding the body of waste products and toxins. Is that true? Well, we're gonna answer these questions, so let's start with how much sweat are we talking here? Depending on the text or the research study you come across, someone who's in a well-controlled environment or a moderate temperature, not doing manual labor and not exercising, they could produce anywhere from 500 to 1,000 milliliters of sweat per day. For context, this is about 500 milliliters of fluid here. But that's one end of the spectrum. What about the other end? Somebody working, doing manual labor in a really hot, humid environment. A marathon runner running in a hot, humid environment. Well, in that case, these eccrine glands could produce up to 10 liters of sweat in a day. That's 20 of these. That's crazy to think about. And the reason for this wide range is there are just so many things that influence and contribute to how much we sweat. One thing that I do wanna mention that's super interesting is that there is actually what we call emotional sweating versus thermoregulatory sweating. In emotional sweating, the eccrine glands are first activated in the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet and the armpits before moving out to the rest of the body. And that's why when you're nervous or emotionally scared or stressed, you'll notice your palms sweat, your feet sweat, and your armpits before like just dripping on your head and face and other areas. Whereas thermoregulatory sweating actually activates the eccrine glands in a different sequence. It starts with the glands on the scalp and the forehead, then moves out throughout the body and will actually hit the palms and the soles of the feet last. That's crazy to think about. Not only have we seen two different types of sweat from the apocrine and the eccrine glands, but even within the eccrine gland, we have a different sequence of how the glands will be recruited based on emotional stress versus other environmental stimuli. And let's be clear on these environmental factors or environmental stimuli that influence how much we sweat. One is just simply the ambient air temperature. The warmer it is, the more we tend to sweat. The amount of water vapor in the air or humidity influences sweating. And here's a really important point. It's not just the sweat that is cooling us down. It's the evaporation of the sweat from the surface of the body that causes this transfer of heat away from the body and cools us down. So when we're talking about humidity, Increased humidity will slow the rate of evaporation of the sweat. And so if you're not having that sweat evaporate as quickly, your body's not gonna cool as quickly. And the body responds by saying, okay, well, I just have to produce more sweat. And that's why we sweat more in humid environments. Another thing that influences this is just clothing, even protective equipment like padding and helmets in certain sporting events. Athletic intensity, or I should say exercise intensity, influences sweating. As we exercise more intensely, sweating goes up. And training status. How fit a person is influences how much they can sweat. A person that is more fit and trains consistently has a greater ability to sweat more. And that is done through modifications of the glands because the cells inside the gland will modify and have the ability to produce more sweat or more of these secretions. Not only do you get it from a training stimulus, but say you have uh, somebody who's working like a manual labor job in a hot and humid environment. These sweat glands will acclimate to that environment and also create these similar adaptations to 
produce more sweat. So somebody who's training and being in, and stimulated in those environments kind of gets both of those stimuli to sweat more, which is kind of funny to think about. But let's use me as an example. Say I'm training for a half marathon. I live in an environment that is somewhat hot in the summer, but not very humid. Say the race that I'm going to compete in is in a hot and humid environment. I travel there, the day after I get there, I run the race. I wouldn't have the ability to sweat as efficiently, if you will, as compared to if I got there and trained there for a few weeks to also get that acclimation effect for my sweat glands. So you can see that, say, somebody who hasn't trained a lot and acclimated to these hot and humid environments might produce like one liter of sweat during an hour of exercise. But somebody who has that training stimulus and is acclimated could produce over two liters per hour during exercise. Not only is more sweat going to be produced, but sweating will start earlier on in exercise. So the cooling process will be initiated earlier when somebody starts exercising. And of course, we need to talk about the loss of salt and electrolytes through sweat. We are pretty clear that this eccrine gland is going to secrete water and fluid, but it's also going to secrete sodium chloride. Sodium chloride is just table salt, and if you've ever tasted your sweat, you know it tastes salty. And as we exercise for longer periods of time, or if we're exercising in hotter and humid environments, the need for electrolyte replacement is going to be greater because these electrolytes are very important to normal body functioning. And so when we're talking about this adaptation and acclimation, I know I'm repeating myself, but yes, this is going to be able to learn to or adapt to produce more fluid, but it will also adapt and change and secrete less sodium and chloride, thereby kind of conserving the electrolytes in the body with these crazy, amazing adaptations. So how does this relate to athletic performance? Well, obviously we get the benefit of creating more sweat and therefore better thermal regulation and cooling. And evaporation of this much sweat can remove heat from the body at a rate greater than 10 times the normal rate of heat production. And there obviously is this trade-off of creating more sweat creates a potential for more fluid loss. And as far as fluid loss and athletic performance is concerned, we tend to see the effects mostly with endurance type activities. With a fluid loss of 1-2% to of body weight in fluid, you don't actually see much of a decrease in performance. And sometimes that can go as high as 3% when you're in like a colder and less humid environment. But once you get above that 3% range, you start to see decreases in what's known as VO2 max, which is this maximal oxygen consumption or this maximal aerobic performance. And you'll also see this generalized decrease in just in overall aerobic fitness too when you start getting to that three to 7% range of fluid loss, again, in, in body weight. Now what's interesting is you don't actually see a huge decrease in anaerobic or muscular strength, even up to three to 5% of body weight fluid loss when we're talking about say like you're doing wind sprints or weightlifting or heavy weightlifting. But if you were to increase those bouts of weightlifting or you were to do longer anaerobic uh, intervals past 30 seconds, you would start to see a decrease in performance. Also, if you started to decrease, say, you like your rest time between sets of weightlifting or like wind sprints, that would also start to creep in there and start to decrease the performance even in those anaerobic or strength training type activities. Now, another thing I do wanna consider is say I have two athletes that one is well hydrated and one is not so well hydrated or hypohydrated. When both of those athletes were to exercise, they would both have an increase in body temperature. But what you would see with the athlete that is hypohydrated, they would start to fatigue at a lower body temperature than the athlete that was well hydrated. And of course, we need to talk about muscle cramps and their relationship to dehydration and loss of electrolytes. Because maybe you've heard that's what causes muscle cramps, loss of electrolytes and dehydration. And I will admit that I continue to partake of electrolyte rich beverages when I'm training for a half marathon, running a half marathon, or maybe playing basketball for multiple hours. Even though the data does not clearly suggest that muscle cramps are caused by dehydration and loss of electrolytes. There's other studies that suggest that people can have normal electrolytes in their body fluids and still experience muscle cramps, kind of leading to this idea that muscle cramps might just be from muscular fatigue over time. And most people who've experienced muscle cramps generally don't experience them at the beginning of an athletic event. It tends to happen towards the end after they're fatigued, but 
that fatigue often does correlate with loss of fluid and loss of electrolytes, so it muddies the water a little bit, and clearly there's a need for more research and data. Now, I am not suggesting that people should stop drinking electrolyte-rich beverages during training, racing, and things of that nature. I would suggest continuing to do that because electrolytes are definitely important to multiple body functions. What I am saying is that it may not magically take your muscle cramps away when you experience them. And finally, let's wrap this up by answering, can these eccrine sweat glands release waste products and toxins from the human body? Well, I think toxins is probably a little strong, but yes, these glands will secrete things like urea, uric acid, ammonia, even lactic acid. Now, I don't really consider lactic acid a waste product, but the other three, yeah, we wanna get rid of. These sweat glands play a small role in getting rid of these products. They do not hold a candle to what the kidneys do. The kidneys do the majority of uh, releasing or excreting these types of waste products from the human body. So yes, sweating can help release some of this, create a pathway for that, but again, it's more about thermal regulation. And if we're talking about the African glands, you know, creating a musty sweat for all those around you to enjoy. As always, thanks for watching everyone. Hopefully you learned something amazing about our sweaty bodies. And speaking of bodies, if you're interested in yoga body, go ahead and check out that link and that information in the description below. These guys are amazing. You won't regret it. And of course, if you feel the need, like and subscribe, blow up the comment section, let us know what you think of sweat or whatever else is on your mind. And we'll see you in the next video.